Okay, I'm going to continue in the book of Numbers. Um, last week we did a double portion outside of Israel, so now we're all caught up with reading the same part, portion in Israel as we're reading in America. And this week's portion is called Pasha Pinchas, um, named after a zealot by the name of Pinchas. Um, and um, so it actually is a continuation, this week's Pasha, of what happened at the end of last week's Pasha. So last week, we didn't really cover it so much, but last week we learned about King, the King Balak, who wanted to curse the Jewish people. So he employed a prophet by the name of Bilam to curse the Jewish people and to cut the long story into a very short story to say that every single word that Bilam said as a curse came out as a blessing. So instead of cursing the Jewish people, he blessed the Jewish people, which was, enrage, was, was enraging to Balak and Bilam, both of whom wanted to curse the Jewish people. And so at the end of last week's Pasha, um, their idea, instead of cursing the Jewish people with words, was to entice them into um, illicit r relations with the, with the women of Midian, and uh, that they would, through that um, immoral sexual reunions with the women of Midian and Moab, that they would come to worship the gods, and they did come to worship the, the gods of those, of those people, uh, Baal Peor, Baal Peor. So I'm going to read you from last week's Torah portion what happened. So, um, so they, they invited the people, the, 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 um, the uh, people of, of uh, Bala, Balaam um, encouraged the Jewish people to commit harlotry with the daughters of Moab. Um, and the, 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 the daughters of Moab um, invited the people to feast with their gods. The people ate and they prostrated themselves to their gods. Israel became attached to Baal Peor. They committed Id idolatry through the sexual... Um, temptations of the women um, they were they were seduced by these women and they took on their the gods of these women they they uh, were enticed by the women sexually and they became to do an immoral act an idolatrous act so what's interesting is that in many places um, sexual immorality is also likened unto idolatry like if you don't hold these laws if you don't hold tight to what God's saying and you stray and you do things that that lead you away from God that's as if you're saying there is no God I'm not holding to this God I don't I don't want I don't want relation with this job if you think about it you know deeply I don't want a relationship with this God so I'm gonna do whatever I want and in turning your back on God you're committing idolatry by doing adultery so these men were engaged in these sexual acts and they also prostrated themselves to the gods of uh, of the women that they were being seduced by so god was angry with that that like like he, he these people he wants a relationship with these people and they and they and now engaged in this in this idolatry in this immorality and so he sends a plague but what happens is that pinchas says in last week's Torah portion. Pinchas, the son of Elazar, who was the son of Aaron, Aaron our high priest, Aaron our man of peace, Aaron the one who wants to establish um, good relationships between all people, bring people together, connect people, bring, bring shlemus, bring wholeness to the Jewish people, that's Aaron. His grandson, Pinchas, stood up from amidst the assembly and he took a spear in his hand and he followed this Israelite man. Sorry, I should back up that there was an Israelite man um, who took a Midianite woman and in the sight, I'm reading it inside, in the sight of Moses and in the sight of the entire assembly of the children of Israel, he had, um, an, 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 uh, he had a sexual union with this, with this woman. So these, the, these, this, this man, this Jewish man and this woman from the Midianite nation had sex in front of all the nation, in front of the tent, everybody. Everybody was crying. Pinchas gets up, he takes a spear in his hand, he followed the Israelite man into the tent and he pierced them. While they're engaged in this act, this sexual union, this conjugal act, he takes a spear and he stabs them and he pierces them both, the Israelite man and the woman, into her stomach and the plague was halted from the children of Israel. Those who died in the plague were 24,000. And that's the end of last week's Pasha. This week's Pasha, Hashem says to Moses, Pinchas, so, you know, you know, in front of everybody, Pinchas got up with a spear and he spears these, these people engaged in this sexual act in front of everybody. So 
you know, what do you think about that? <laughs> like, it doesn't seem like something that we would go around doing. And uh, how do you judge whether that was the right thing to do or not? So God says to Moses, I'm reading inside the Torah, Pinchas, son of Elazar, son of Aaron the Kohen, turned back my wrath from upon the children of Israel when he zealously avenged me amongst them. So I did not consume the children of Israel in my vengeance. So he gets rewarded. Pinchas gets rewarded with the covenant of peace and it shall be for him and his offspring after him a covenant of eternal priesthood because Pinchas took vengeance for his God and he atoned for the children of Israel. So what's going on here? What's going on here is you have the people engaged in idolatry, sexual immorality. You have Pinchas, who's the grandson of Aaron, the high priest, takes a spear and he kills them. Nobody tells him to do it. No, he, he didn't go to, to Moses and say, shall I do this? He, on his own, on his own sense of um, impropriety, his own sense that this is the wrong thing to do. We have to stop what's going on in the camp. We have to stop what's happening. And he gets up and with that great love and connection that he has for God, he spears and he kills these two people. And when they, and when they are killed, the plague stops. And then God says to Moses, there's, there's my man, you know, he did, he did what I needed to be done, but he did it as a man and I'm going to reward him. What he did was a zealous act done out of love for the Jewish people and love for God. So Pinchas is sort of this intermediary instead of God taking out his wrath on the people for doing this immoral, adulterous, idolatrous um, goings on, instead of God taking out his wrath, Pinchas becomes the agent for the wrath. So the analogy that I heard is if you have a child who does something and, the, and one parent is very, very, very angry with the child, so angry that the child, the, the, the child is like really in for it. So the other parent, uh, you know, if there were two parents, if there are two parents and there are two parents parenting this one child. So one parent is super angry and the other parent says, you know what, let me take care of it. I'm not as angry as you. I'm going to go, I'm going to be perhaps more effective in the lesson um, if I go in without the wrath, without the anger, without that consuming me. So I'm going to be the agent for us, the parents. I'm going to be that agent, but I'm going to do it in a way that perhaps can be heard more or is less filled with anger. And that's the analogy given as to what Pinchas was doing. Pinchas was essentially injecting himself into the punishment that God was giving the Jewish people by bringing this plague. And he came in and by killing these two people, whose names are Zimri and Cosby, by killing them, the plague was ended. And then God comes along and he says to Moses, that was a good thing, thumbs up. That was what I wanted to have happen. And it's interesting because if you go back to Moses, when he comes down off of Mount Sinai, he's holding the tablets of stone when he were written by God, like these amazing um, treasure, gift that God gave him to bring down to the Jewish people. He sees the Jewish people engaged in the debacle of the golden calf. They're worshiping this golden calf. And what does Moses do? He takes the tablets and he throws them down. Nobody told him to. God, God didn't tell him to throw them down. God didn't tell him to drop them. God didn't tell him to break them, but he breaks them. And the, the, the sequel is God's pleased with him. That was the right thing to have done. But however, you know, we don't learn that God says, okay, Moses, please break those, break them, shatter them. You have to come up and get a second pair. Like that doesn't merit to be used by the Jewish people. We don't, we don't have any um, uh, backstory that says that Pinchas was told by God to do what he did. And he didn't consult with Moses. He just did this on his own, but he's rewarded in the aftermath. In the aftermath, God comes along and says to Moses, great, it was a good thing to do. I'm now going to reward him with peace. So isn't it interesting that from an act of killing, Pinchas is rewarded with peace. He's rewarded with a priesthood. These are two rewards that you would not think would go hand in hand with an act of killing. So I think what's interesting is um, there's, a, there's an idea that when you behave a certain way, if you behave a certain way and you keep behaving a certain way and you keep doing, keep doing that thing, that that becomes like your modus operandi. It becomes who you are. If the, there's a classic story given as to if you had a hundred dollars and uh, you were, that was money you want to give away. So you want to give it to Sadaka. Do you give a hundred dollars to one cause 
or do you take the hundred dollars divide it up and give a dollar here a dollar there a dollar there a dollar there and the answer is you do the latter you do the distribution of each dollar because what it does is it trains you to be a giver so if you're giving and you're giving and you're giving it's different than one time giving one time a giver walk away here I'm exercising my giving muscle I'm doing it over and over and over and again it becomes me hopefully so in the case of Pinchas, when he comes along and he kills, it's a one-time killing. It doesn't define him as a person. He did this killing because he had a higher motive. The higher motive was love for the Jewish people. The Jewish people are being killed off by a plague. The Jewish people are doing these, these acts of immorality and idolatry. And in their love, there's, in his love for the Jewish people and in his love for God and, and seeing how it's tearing the relationship between God and the Jewish people apart, he has to step up and he has to do something and he does it with passion and he does it brazenly and he just does what he sees with great clarity that he has to do and he does it. So, so that we would have that clarity, that we would know the right thing to do always in the right moment at the right time. And even if it's something like killing, and I, obviously we're in a different world and we don't, we don't do that. We don't do that. <laughs> but look what happens back there where there's a clarity of vision that, that Pinchas had, that this was the right thing to do and he did it. So what's also interesting is that he was the only one that did it. He was the only one that stood up and acted and, and lived to his conscience, lived to his soul, lived to what he knew was the right thing to do. And uh, I guess that's where you could bring that message down into our day with the uh, bystander problem. Like if you are witness to something, if you see people doing things that, you, that are wrong, that are outright wrong and you have that clarity and you have but you know again we we question ourselves so much but uh to to not stand by to stand up to say something to do something to um bullies in in schools you know that was or bullies online that was really something that uh that would speak about this issue where where other other children or other people would watch another child being bullied and not step in and not say something and say you can't do that or that's not right or like you know let, let report them to the higher authorities etc like the idea that we stand around and we say well it's not my problem or it's not my issue and i'm not going to get involved and it's nothing to do with me and uh this is a case where where Pinchas is demonstrating as an example of doing something bold and brazen and passionate because of his deep-seated clarity of vision and, and passion for knowing that this was the right thing to do. And when he did it, right, he then is rewarded with, uh, with peace because what he did was establish peace. The people were dying. The people were go being led astray. The people were committing idolatry. And he restored peace back between God and the Jewish people, such that, such that the next thing we read about in the Torah portion is God taking a census, counting the people again. And we, and every time we see a census taking in the Torah, every time we see that, there's one commentary amongst many that says that counting is a form of love. When I count my, whatever it is that you love, if you count your, whatever, you count your children or you count your blessings there's something there's something about counting that is a relationship of i want to you know i want to like think about those things and i want to remember those those people or i, I you know, the counting is done out of love so when god counts the jewish people it's done out of love so there's an establishment a re-establishment of the relationship the plague stops pinchas gets rewarded with peace and with um and with the priesthood so it's pretty amazing that he stood up, did the right thing, was the right thing, and he's known as this zealot for all times. So what's also interesting is that Pinchas, and I love this stuff, Pinchas is considered, like we know they have an idea that the Jewish soul, who we are, like our breath, our, our part of us that comes from the divine, is something that can come around and go around, like reincarnating. We call that a Gilgul, that there's Gilgulim, there's the soul that goes around. So we're all old souls, we're all souls that are coming around. We've all been in previous lives, we're all coming back. We have certain work to do and certain parts of our soul that has to be fixed and things that we have to do in this world. So it's said in, our, in, the, uh, in the Kabbalistic teachings that Pinchas and Eliyahu, Elijah the prophet, are the same soul. That they were, they are reincarnations of each other. That Elijah the prophet is a Gilgul of Pinchas, 
And uh, we also understand that neither Pinchas, in, again, in the Kabbalistic teachings, that Pinchas and Elijah don't actually die, that they don't go the way of all men, which is to separate body and soul. The, soul, the body goes into the ground, the soul goes up into the world of souls, and that disconnection that happens such that the body has to go into the ground, has to be um, uh, uh, reunited with the dust from where it came, and then it will be reconstituted in the time, in the future, when there's the, the, the resurrection, etc. We'll not talk about that now, but, but, what, what, but what we understand about Elijah and about Pinchas is that their bodies don't die, that they, they go up into the heavens, body and soul, together. So that is the reason given, one of the reasons given, as to why it is that Elijah, who is the reincarnation of Pinchas, who brought peace, who's about peace, who's about continuity, who's about keeping the Jewish people together. So Elijah, in the body-soul form that goes up into the heavens, he comes back down at all these times. When does he come back? He comes back at every circumcision. He comes back at the Passover Seder. We open the door for Elijah the prophet. There's a concept that actually Elijah does come. We don't always see him, obviously, but it, it, there's an idea that Elijah is at every circumcision, at every uh, at every Passover Seder, and um, and he also is there at the end of Shabbat when we do the Havdalah service. We sing a song, Eliyahu. And we speak about, we sing about Eliyahu because he's, come, he's coming there. It's about the Jewish people continuing to keep Shabbat. It's about the Jewish people continuing to do the, 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 the commandment of the mitzvah of Brit Milah, doing the circumcision, about the Passover Seder, fundamental aspects of our Jewish life, of who we are as Jews, how we continue ourselves into the future. By doing these things, Eliyahu comes and he's part of that. Because of Pinchas, what Pinchas did when he stopped this plague, when he stopped the Jewish people from doing these acts, when he reestablished relationships for the future. So, so, so Pinchas, we don't really talk about him a lot, but he really did a, a lot for the Jewish people. Okay, so that's, that's the beginning of when we talk, we talk about Pinchas. He was an ordinary man. He was descended from, from, um, Aaron, from Aaron. But he was not consecrated. He was not in the inauguration. He was too young to be um, made a priest. So at the time of the inauguration of the tabernacle in the desert, when Moses is giving Aaron, his brother, the kahuna, giving him the priesthood, and to his, the sons of Aaron, so P Pinchas was too little and he wasn't included in that. And now after this act, this act of bringing peace, of bringing peace through killing, which is interesting, he gets the kahuna, he gets the priesthood, he gets to be part of that lineage, he gets to be one of the people who's going to serve in the temple and do that along with um, the, other, the other children of Aaron. So what's, what's also interesting is sometimes that we may have to, and I don't quite know, I don't have a good example for this, but sometimes we may have to do something for a greater good. We may have to do something that doesn't feel right, right? It might not feel right ever to kill somebody. But sometimes there might be, and this is an example, and I, I don't have a good example, and I haven't, haven't got one, but if you have one, please type it in the group or send it to me, where we do something that ends up, it might have, be egregious to do, it might be against our sensitivity to do something like killing, obviously not like killing, but something else, in order for the greater good, in order to bring about this greater good, that there's something we, we, we did that needed to be done in order to bring about this bigger good. So I'm not justifying anything. I'm not saying you know, we can do these things. But it's interesting that we read about Pinchas and how to bring that into our lives. And I think one of the biggest lessons that I bring into my life is not being a bystander, like the other people just standing around, and not to be led astray by our desires, by the things that we want. Like the people were, were, were so um, lusting after these women that they kind of lost their seichel, they lost their minds, and they did things, and they... But they um, worshipped the Baal Pa'or, this god, um, because they wanted the relationship with the women, they wanted the sexual, sexuality with the women, they took them away, took them away. So like, hold, hold firm. And Pinchas was able to hold firm. Hold firm to our beliefs, hold, hold firm to who we are, hold firm to our core of what's right and to know what's right and how do we know what's right. So here comes Pinchas and he says, even though killing in general is wrong, in this situation it's right, it has to be done in order to bring about peace. And he does it, and he does it without consulting with anyone. He just listens to his inner voice. He knows what his inner voice is telling him that this is the right thing to do, and it is the right thing to do. We are all murky. We don't know what the right thing is always to do. And so it's harder for us. But uh, back then we had that clarity. 
And really what's happening now, we're, as we said um, last week, that we're getting to the end of our journey in the desert. We're about to enter into the land of Israel. We're about to leave behind the overt miracles of the desert. And we're about to move into to the land of Israel. And the land of Israel is flowing with milk and honey. But the land of Israel is hard. There's people there that we have to conquer. We have to, we have to win over the land. Another reason why the census is given. So we know who we have. We know who our armies can be to go in and conquer the land. We also are going to, and we'll read about it later in this week's Torah portion, going to inherit the land. The 12 tribes that come from Jacob, our forefather, are going to be given different parts of the land. And that's going to be their inheritance. They're going to inherit the land of Israel. So we have to know who you are. We have to know how big your tribe is, how many of you there are, how much land. Bigger tribes get more land. Smaller tribes get smaller pieces of land, etc. So that's another reason why the census is given. So the census is given for love, for the, the, the military understanding of how to conquer the land and also how to distribute the inheritance of the land that the people will, will, then, will then inherit pieces of the land. So that's, that's one of the reasons why it's given the census. But we're going to go into this land. And what's going to happen in the land is we have to work it. We have to sow the seeds and we have to, re we have to water them and we have to like, it's not going to come ha down from heaven. It's going to have to be something that we work. We work the land and it's going to be this transition. So what's happening is we're transitioning from God telling us what to do. Here we are in the desert, God's telling us what to do all the time and teaching us the Torah all the time through Moses and we're learning and we're developing a relationship with God but when we enter into the land it's going to be a different kind of relationship we're not going to have we're not going to have Moses anymore we're not going to have the word of God through and coming through Moses we're going to have to you know on some level bring it bring it out from within us we're going to have to learn it we're going to have to toil in it toil in the land toil physically toil, toil emotionally spiritually toil in many different ways to understand how to have that relationship with God, which is more accessible and easier for us in the desert, much harder for us in Israel. So we're transitioning. So here comes Pinchas, and he's taking taking the law into his own hands, so to speak. Nobody told him to do it. He didn't hear it from God, go do this. He didn't hear it from Moses, go do this. He did it on his own. And it's beginning that transition. It's showing us um, examples of, and we'll read a couple more as we go through this week's Torah portion of People taking responsibility, thinking for themselves, so to speak, and um, and challenging, challenging what's going on around them, and that's what Pinchas does. And I think it's a it's an important thing sometimes when we're when we're clouded by the world around us, like how to like have that clarity, how to really like zero in. This is the right thing to do, <laughs> and I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it like with a with a tunnel vision and not get distracted by all the noise that's all around us. Okay, so after the census, after the, 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 the incident of um, Pinchas and after the census, the next thing we have is um, the, um, let, me, let me just get this so I can read it to you. Um, we have um, the daughters of Sl Sl Slavchad. So Slavchad, I'm going to actually read it to you because I think that's a good way to start. Um, and we, as I mentioned, we were talking. We're talking about the land being distributed amongst the people. So the people, Moses goes up onto the onto this mountain, Arabim, and he looks out over the land, and God tells him where different people, where different tribes are going to be inherit their land. So the daughters of Slavchad, um, and it gives his hierarchy. These are the names. It gives the names of these daughters. And they stood before Moses before Elazar the Kohen, and before the leaders and the entire assembly, at the entrance to the tent of meeting, saying, Our father died in the wilderness. So Slavcha died in the wilderness. But he was not amongst the assembly that was gathered, gathering against Hashem in the assembly of Korach. He was not part of the Korach rebellion, which we read um, a couple of weeks ago. But he died of his own sin, and he had no son, Five daughters, no son. Why should the name of our father be omitted from amongst his family? Because he has no son. Give us a possession amongst our father's brothers. And Moses brought their claim before God. So here these women saying, we're not going to get a piece of the land. We, actually, these daughters are descended from Joseph. And how much did Joseph love? It's so interesting how this sort of like this, 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 um, emotional connection to the land kind of gets inherited so joseph who dies in egypt wants and asks moses 
to uh, make sure, is it Moses? I, I, I can't remember who he asked, sorry. Um, to make sure that his bones get taken out. He doesn't want, to be, doesn't want to be forever buried in Egypt. Take my bones with you in the future when you leave and you're gonna go to the promised land, take me with you. I love that Jewish land, I wanna go into that Jewish land. And here are the descendants of Joseph inheriting, so to speak, perhaps in their emotional, um, religious, Zionistic DNA. They also want to go into land. They love the land. We want a portion of the land. The inheritance rules, the halacha, the law that we're learning now says only men get to go and in, get inheritance in the land. But we don't have any brothers. There's no inheritance. And our father, who was not part of the Korach rebellion, um, his name will be lost because there'll be no land apportioned to him. So what do, why does Moses, why can't Moses decide this on his own? It's interesting because the fact that Slavchad was not part of the Korach rebellion would in some way, says some of our commentators, make um, Moses be biased, that he would be favorably inclined to these, to these daughters because Slavchad was not somebody who challenged his leadership. So there's even the slight perception that he would be swayed by this fact, the fact that the father wasn't involved in the rebellion against Moses is already um, a, a, a possible, possibly could influence Moses' decision. So it has to go, it has to go up a notch, it has to go to God. Like Moses can't um, adjudicate this case because he has a vested interest. Even if it seems like such a nothing vested interest, there's a story in the oral tradition about um, a man, a judge who's on the way to a court case and somebody opens the door for him and holds the door for him. And they have a little interaction. He asks, where are you going? And it turns out that the man who's holding the door is um, uh, is involved in one of the court cases. And so the judge says, I'm sorry, now I know this. You did an act of kindness for me. You held the door open for me. Little act it doesn't seem like it's anything. How careful we have to be. And how much everything we do affects other people. <laughs> you know, just even think that. Like just holding a door open for someone is... Um, on some level is, a, is, is an act of giving and it kind of, kind of influences the relationship you have. So how important it is to open doors for people. So opening the door meant that this judge would now be um, influenced uh, because of his favorable impression or in favorable uh, relationship now with this quote-unquote stranger who opened the door for him. So now he has to recu recluse himself. He has to keep himself out of the case. He can't judge that case. So too, Moses when he learns that the daughters of Slavchad, um, that Slavchad was not part of the rebellion. So now I'm, I, I, it's like, now I'm not, I'm not impartial. I have, I have, a, uh, I have a, a connection to these daughters that's more favorable. And so I can't, I can't adjudicate. So it goes to God. So he takes it to God and God says, you're right. God says, um, God says the daughters of um, Slavchad speak properly. Um, you shall surely give them a possession of inheritance among the brothers of their father, and you shall cause the inheritance of their father to pass over to them. And the children of Israel, you shall speak, saying, if a man will die and he has no son, you shall cause his inheritance to pass over to his daughters, to his daughter. So, so here's a case where you have these daughters saying, we we love God. We love the Jewish tradition. We love the land. We like, there's so much that we, that we feel is not, not right about this situation. And they bring it to the, to Moses and God brings it and Moses brings it to God and God says, you're right, I'm going to change it. So here's another case where it's coming from the ground up, right? So in the desert, it's top down. And now we're learning ground up. We're learning that we get to hold on to the Torah. We get to decide on some level how to interpret it, what it means, how to how to position it, how to take into account. And 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 this is and but they bring it to God and God says, so there's clarity there. We understand. So what's murky in our world is we don't have that mechanism to change things. 
um, and it's there's a uh, I'm not going into the mechanism by which we decide what Jewish law is, uh, but we don't have the same mechanism that we had in the desert where God says like this is the way it is. Like listen to those daughters. Those daughters have a case. Those daughters are coming with um, the right intention. And again, we talk about intention. Or many many times we talk about intention. When we talked about Korach, the intention was was off. It might have a, a reasonable argument, but he was so arrogant that he didn't have the right intention. We have Pinchas who did something that was very brazen and very bold and very confident but he had the right intention the intention was to um, be the mediator for God's vengeance to to allow allow this to be the response so that the Jewish people would be spared from the plague so that would bring back the Jewish people into relationship with God that his intention was correct it wasn't about him it's not about me that take the I out of it and put God into it then you have the right intention Right, so it's a lot about bringing out. So, so, so Korach isn't able to do that. Pinchas is able to do that, and we learn that the daughters of Slachad are able to do that. So that's that's a, another lesson where where we're learning this transition of taking of taking the Jewish people um, being able to evaluate for themselves, like what works and how to and how to understand and to and to and to say this isn't fair, and we want the, we want a piece of land. And God says, okay, great, you get a piece of the land. So how lovely is that? And actually. Um, very, very apropos what's happened in Israel today, not today, not exactly today, but in, in this, I think it was even last week, where um, many, many, many women who are learning Torah in Israel, and um, they're learning the same text that men are learning, but they didn't have, up until now, they didn't have accreditation, they weren't given the, 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 um, the titles and so on to, to um, take some jobs that would give them equal pay from the men. I don't know enough about it, but I do know that there was a... Um, uh, a decision made that the learning of women would come now with a greater recognition and um, and and a title and a recognition that their learning um, is, you know, up there with the men. So that's that's what's going on in Israel. But again, the women saying like we're learning too, and we sh- if we, if we take a job teaching and, and a man takes a job teaching, we have the same equal pay. We're doing the same job. We should get the pay the same. So, and again, maybe it's a, a spin-off on looking back into the Torah and saying, okay, well, this happened in the desert, you know, thousands of years ago. How does it apply to us today? Well, we're seeing it in Israel today where the women are saying, well, you know, we're learning. We're, we're, we're women who are connecting ourselves to God and we're learning Torah and we want the recognition for that and they're getting it. So how lovely is that? So we see it even in our, in our day. All right, so this is the daughters of Slavchad. And then what happens after that is we have Moses. So Moses, as we know from him hitting the rock, we learned about that last week, where he is now, because you didn't, you didn't, and there's a lot of conversation as to what he did wrong exactly and why Moses doesn't get to go into the land with the people that he has brought out of Egypt. He's been their leader all along. He's been the leader who has, has been the intermediary between, between God and the Jewish people and teaching them Torah and learning Torah and going off Mount Sinai and bringing all the plagues and bringing them out in the desert etc etc he's going to die he's not going to take the people into the land so god says to moses go up to the go up to the mountain of arabim and see the land that i have given to the children of israel you can see it you shall see it and you shall be gathered unto your people you will die um, as your brother Aaron was also gathered in because you rebelled against my word in the wilderness of zin we talked about that when he hit the rock instead of talking to the rock um, and it continues to say Moses says, Moses says to God, may God, may Hashem, God of the spirits of all flesh, appoint a man over the assembly. So now Moses is asking God to, to find a leader who shall go out before them and come in before them, who shall take them out and bring them in and let the assembly of Hashem not be like sheep that have no shepherd. So Moses pleads to God, is you God who are, and it's interesting that the, the terminology that he uses is that you are the God of all spirits of all flesh, meaning, meaning that, that, that we, and, and it went back even when Pinchas says, my God, you know, that, that the Jewish idea of, of God is that he is intimately connected to every single person that we have an intimate relationship with God. Yes, we have leaders and rabbis and intermediaries and prophets and but we also have our own relationship to God. We are all a little piece of Hashem. Our soul is breathed into us by God breathing our souls into us. We are a part of it. We have a divine uh, part of us. 
there's a divine part of us that connects us to God, each one of us. So interestingly, I heard a talk um, a couple of days ago by a woman who um, delineated in a way that I thought was really, really actually um, profound about how to see ourselves as souls with bodies rather than bodies with souls. So who am I? I'm, I'm, am I a body with a soul? Or am I a soul with a body? So one of the ways in which she suggests to think is to say that I am a soul. And what is it that my soul does? How does my soul, and it, yes, it animates us, and, and yes, it's, it's, a, it's a part of us that is transcendent, but how does that manifest in our everyday, every one of us? And it, she says, and I, and I, you know, it's sort of just clarifying things that perhaps we already know, but the part of us that loves other people, that's your soul. The part of us that loves God is our soul. The part of us that, that thinks that, that, that is anything not physical, right? The part of us that wants to give, the part of us that forgives other people, the part of us that makes decisions, that is the decision maker part of us. Um, the part of us, so if you just think about the part of us that gives, just that part, say, okay, so if I want to be, if I want to see my soul, myself as a soul, then I want to do soul things. <laughs> what are soul things? Soul things are loving, soul things are giving, soul things are forgiving, soul things are connecting to God, how through prayer, through study, through, um, through, through, through acting with the intention to connect to God. So the intention, the thought, the mind, the love, the emotions, all these are our soul. So if I want to see other people as a soul, I have to see those things. Um, and this was given in the context, this is getting a little bit off track, but this was given in the context of a talk about modesty, about the, the Jewish concept of snoot. Um, but, but, but really it's about our relationship to God. Like, is that the paramount relationship? Is that what we're concentrating on? If we're concentrating on our relationship with God and then seeing each other as also God-like, that we have this image of God, that we have this soul, that we can see each other, try to see each other more, as, as their souls than their bodies, then we'll be then we'll be in the right and going in the right way. So when Moses says to God, "You are the God. You are the Spirit of all flesh. You, you God, are connected to every single person. Every single person is connected to you because you are the God of the Spirit of their flesh. And help me, help me." says Moses, to find someone who will shepherd them, that they shouldn't be like sheep without a shepherd. And if you go back to what, that, that, that encounter that God and Moses have at the burning bush. So how did Moses get to that burning bush? He's shepherding the sheep of, of Yisro, of Jethro. He's shepherding those sheep and one of the sheep strays off. But he's such a loving shepherd. He doesn't. He doesn't say, "Oh, oh, it's only one. Let it go." No. He's like, "Oh no, it's a, sh it's a sheep. It's a real sheep. I have to go get that sheep. It's a real, and I guess it's not a person, <laughs> but you know, in in the analogy, Moses cares about each single sheep such that he'll go out of his way to chase that one sheep that strayed off and go get it and carry it back. And in that encounter, he, he, he and he sees the the burning bush and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. But the point is that the sheep that strayed is worthy of Moses going out of his way to go collect it and bring it back. And so that exemplifies the kind of characteristic that we want the leader to be. Every sheep counts. We might be a flock. We might be like the stars of the heaven. We might be like the sand in the seashore, but every one of us counts. God's counting all of us. We need a leader who's gonna care for every single one of us, not just the bulk not just the bell curve, not just the middle, everyone, even all those people on the outside. I'm not sure we do a great job about that, but, but all the people that don't fit in the mean, that the people are on the outside, the people on the edges, like the single people and the widows, and yes, we're told to take care of them, but are we? Are we really taking care of them? The people who can't, whatever. Anyway, keep going with, the, with, those, with those people who are on the outliers, not quite so central to the community. How do we bring them in? How do we shepherd them? 
how do we become leaders in our day? We'll be, perhaps we don't have the leaders like Moses. Um, we don't have a leader like that. Like we have different leaders and we choose our leaders and perhaps leadership is, is getting a little bit more watered down in our day, not sure. But um, anyway, so here we have Moses saying, I know you God are going, going to not let me go into the land. I can see the land, I see it. I'm going to pass away. You're going to kiss me. I'm going to lose my soul through a kiss up on this mountain. But in the meantime, we need to find a successor. Who's my successor? Who's going to take over from me? So God says to Moses, take yourself Joshua, son of Nun, a man in whom there is spirit and lean your hands upon him. Give him smicha. Make him like the rabbi. <laughs> Make him like the leader. This is the, the, the smicha. He's going to lay his hands on top. Lay your hand, actually lay your hand. It says one hand, but he puts both hands. Um, you shall stand him before Allah the Kohen and before the entire assembly. Everybody has to see it and command him before their eyes. You shall place some of your majesty upon him. So the entire assembly of Israel will pay heed. You have to do this publicly. It has to be known that you, Moses, you are the sun, S-U-N. You shine. You have had, um, this is me, this is not in the Torah, this is me. Like, so Moses who went up onto Mount Sinai, who had that face-to-face -face relationship with God, who exudes God through the shine. And when he came down from Mount Sinai, he had to hide his face, he had to veil it with so much light and transcendent emanating from his face that it, it was too much of the people. They couldn't see it. They had to cover his face. So Moses represents the sun and Joshua will be like the moon, reflecting that. Like, it's, not, it's not the same shine coming from the inside. It's more of a reflection. He's more like the moon. But it has to be seen that you're doing this. So lay your hands. Give him smicha publicly to know that, the, that this is the next leader. Um, and um, anyway, so, so he becomes the next leader. Joshua becomes the next leader. And uh, so why, why Joshua? And one of the reasons given why it's Joshua is the leader is because Joshua is the faithful, faithful companion, companion, um, co-leader not co-leader because Aaron is the co-leader Miriam but sort of like the the sidekick so to speak so it describes in the tradition that he would be like the guy who goes into the shawl and sets up the chairs and sets up the pews and sets up everything like 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 he does whatever whatever Moses needs he's he's there he's there he's always there he's always he's the guy he's just always there but he's not just there doing he's there learning and he's not just learning when it's time to learn, he's learning all the time. He's watching. He's watching Moses. How does Moses act? What does Moses do? Where does Mo how does Moses deal with this? Like it's 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 a it's a knowledge that comes imbued from this 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 constant relationship that he had with Moses. That he saw it. That he that he wanted it. That he wanted to be like that. That he yearned to 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 grow himself and to and to be able to be like Moses, like a, like a Moses wannabe, uh, maybe. And so he um, uh, divested himself of his own ego to try to kind of like connect and, and attach himself to Moses. So that, the, that it's correct that it should be go to Joshua. I mean, there are other people it could go to. And what's interesting is, if you remember that Joshua was one of the spies that went into the land. There were, there were, there were, there were 12 spies that went into the land and 10 of the spies come back with an evil report. We spoke about this um, when we spoke about the episode of the spies. But the two... There are two spies who, who, who don't come back and they, and they stand up and say, it's a beautiful land and we can do this and let's go do this. Um, Caleb and Joshua. And uh, before even Joshua goes in, Moses changes his name, gives him a yud. It's like, you're going to need this extra infusion of help because it's going to be hard to stand up to what's going to come. It's hard for you. It's going to be hard to stand up and again, not be that bystander, not just go around. Um, and uh, it's going to be hard to do that. So we're going to add that, that letter U to your name. And here in this, in this episode where God says, put your hand, one hand on top of Joshua, give him your bracha, give him your smicha, give him your, your knowledge, give him your, 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 your what is, what's the word that's used here? It's translated as majesty, your hod, your hod. Give, him, give him that. 
But Moses puts both hands on, like, I'm, I'm going to give you more, like, I want to give you more, like, this is your, now I'm giving it to, over to you. And, and, and how, and how he's able to do that again, Moses, so humble, so humble, so humble, he had his own sons, and perhaps he, he wanted his sons to be the successor of him, or, or um, Caleb, who was the other spy, or, or Elaza, who was the son of Aaron, there were other people who could have taken on this role, but God says, no, it's, it's Joshua, Joshua is going to be the guy. And uh, Moses does it, for, no, no question, fine. You know, it's all like God says, okay, I'll do it. So he's, uh, he's, uh, he's giving over his, his uh, leadership to Joshua ben Nun. Um, let's see, let's see if there's anything else I wanted to say about that. Um, okay, so that's what I wanted to say about that, about, the, about Moses um, giving over the leadership, knowing that he's going to die, knowing he's not going to go into the land, seeing the land, how it's going to be a portion to all the people, um, the inheritance that went to the daughters of Slavchad, um, even though it wasn't the law at the time that they challenged that law and they were successful in that challenge. Pinchas, who's able to stand up for what he sees to be the right thing, even if nobody's telling him that it's the right thing, he knows on the inside that that is the right thing to do. Um, and so the last thing that happens in this week's Torah portion is that we learn about the uh, we learn about certain offerings so previous in the torah we had many many conversations um, especially in the parsha and more about the different sacrifices that come into the come into the tabernacle and here we're going to learn again about some of the sacrifices not all of them but we're going to learn about the um, continual daily offerings the sheep that you bring in the morning and the sheep that you bring at night so um, let's see if i can find it inside i actually didn't um, here, um, the one lamb shall you make in the morning and the second lamb shall you make in the afternoon. So we're going to bring, we're going to bring these offerings in the morning and the night. And, um, I, this is, this is given as a example of a very deep concept, which is that there's something about consistency and there's something about, um, perseverance. So when we're persistent, when we keep doing something, we keep doing it over and over and over again. Like we talked about it before with, um, in the antithesis, in the opposite, right? Pinchas does this killing, but doesn't become him. If he killed and killed and killed and killed, he would become, it would like change him. It would sensitize him differently, but he only did it once because it had to be done, had to be done then. But if we bring our offering every day, we have to bring an offering. So let's bring it every day. Let's bring it in the morning. Morning representing clarity when we're happy, when things are good, when we have, when we see what's going on, when we have, well, we don't really see what's going on, but when we think we see what's going on or where there's, the sun's come up and it's another beautiful day or perhaps, and we, there's a certain level of excitement and happiness in the morning representing clarity and an and ascent. And then at night, when it's dark and we don't see clearly and we don't know, or when times are bad, we're still bringing that offering. We're bringing that offering in the morning when it's clear and we're bringing the offering at the night when it's not clear and we don't know, but we're bringing it because we know it's the right thing to do, because we know it was what God wants us to do and we're bringing it persistently and consistently. And I think about it a little bit with this Shia. Like there are many times I say, oh, you know, like I've got too much going on this week. I can't give the Shia this week. But I, but I, I don't want to do that. Like it's almost like this lesson repeating itself. Like just this is you, you, you committed to it. This is something that you need to do consistently. So whatever it is in our lives, do we need to maybe, maybe nowadays with Corona and being quarantined, there's more of a need to have consistent things that we do. Certain times where we do certain things. Certain, certain. Um, aspects of ourselves that we want to work on and it won't just happen it won't just happen on its own it's going to have to be like you make a timetable okay this day on this day at this time I'm going to whatever it is and when I wake up I'm going to say moda ani I'm going to say thank you for my life thank you for returning my soul to me thank you and it feeds into this the morning that morning one prayer we say in the morning if anybody wants to know it don't know it please contact me privately but this moda ani that we say thank you i thank you thank you starts with the moda not with the i thank you god for giving me back my soul because you have faith in me you have faith in me that i have something to do today there's a reason why i'm alive today there's something i have to do and that you have faith in me and i in return have faith in you and I'm going to bring that offering in the morning and I'm going to bring the offering in the evening and I'm going to keep doing it day in, day out, day in, day out. 
and it's going to become me, right? If I say moda ani every morning, after a while, don't even think about it. You open your eyes and you say moda ani. It's just what you say. But now the challenge is to think about it, <laughs> not just say it, but to actually think about it. But there's something that it becomes ingrained. It becomes a part of you. And so now move on to the next thing. What's the next thing I'm going to take on? What's the next thing that I need to work on to have more intention, to more to more be in my soul than in my body? How do I do that? Um, find a time to learn. Find a time to meditate. Find a time to be kind to other people. Find a time to give. Find time to pick up that phone or whatever it is and be forgiving to the people that you begrudge or that you have issues with. Like, let's work on those things. Like, can we do that now in this time? Time where 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 we're like all for smuggled if that's a real word all right and so that's really I'm, I'm that's really what I want to say I think that's really the the, the the hits the high points of this week's Torah portion so let's just quickly recap in the beginning we learned about Pinchas who was an avenger he av avenged for God what was going on amongst the Jewish people the Jewish people were led by Bilam from last week's Torah portion into sexual relations with the uh, with the women of Midian and in that in that seduction they engaged in idolatry with the Baal Pa'or with the god of the of the Midianite women they engaged in that and that led to a plague so the 24,000 people died in the plague until Pinchas Pinchas stood up with a spear and in the, in the sexual act of these two people Zimri and Cosby killed them and the plague stops. It was in the eyes of all the people. Everybody saw it and nobody else stood up. Message number one, nobody else stood up. So let's not be bystanders. Let's stand up. Let's have clarity of vision. And God says that was the right thing to do. Okay, so at least he got the, uh, the, um, the feedback that that was the right thing to have done. But he wasn't looking for the feedback. He was looking to... He was looking to do what God needed to be done. He understood this is what God needed to be done, and he did it unequivocally, um, unflinchingly, with great um, courage and bravery. He stood up, and in that heroic moment, he brought about the end of the plague, and he brought back the Jewish people. And and that, that after that, then we now have the counting of the Jewish people. We love you. I love you, the Jewish people. Interestingly, we talk about survivors. Um, there's a story I, I heard because so these the people who didn't die in the plague obviously are all the survivors that there's a there's something about survivors so maybe I'm not sure about these survivors but certainly survivors from the Shoah from the Holocaust are are like special holy people and uh, there's a st I don't know if the story is true but you know it's sort of one of those stories where somebody comes and asks asks for a blessing from the rabbi and the rabbi says don't ask me for a blessing go go over there to that old man and the man was the you know, the numbers on his arm, ask him for a blessing. You know, that's where you'll get the blessing. These people who, who went through, went through, went through that, they, they'll give you the blessing. Okay, so what did Pinchas do? He acted for the people. He, excuse me, he acted so God didn't have to do it. And we're entering now, tomorrow, we're entering this three-week period that's going to lead to Tisha B'Av, where God destroys the, the uh, temples in Jerusalem. So this is the beginning tomorrow, this three-week period that leads up to that. But the but that actually is also an example where the, 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 the people are spared and the building is destroyed. The building, the, the uh, tabernacle, the, the temple in Jerusalem is destroyed, not the people. Um, and similarly here, you know, we have, we have Pinchas coming in and stopping what, 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 where what, this plague that was continuing to like kill off the Jewish people. So stop that. And that's not going to happen. We're going to, we're going to bring it back. It's going to, it's going to. We, we had to have that person to come in and stop that from happening. Okay, so we have that. So here we have, you know, somebody who wasn't indifferent, somebody who, who, um, who, just, who just acted. Um, and and Ellie Wiesel is known to say, always e there's always evil, but uh, something, something about, I haven't got the exact quote, but it's something about there's always evil in the world. Uh, but but evil will persist if there aren't people around to stand up. If we are indifferent, evil will raise its head. So let's not be indifferent. Let's stand up. Let's um, let's let's look for the truth. Not be a bystander. Okay. So now um, we have the daughters of Slavchad and how they challenged the fact they couldn't have a piece of the land, and they were the they were told that you they were right that they would be able to get a piece of the land. It's interesting way in which now the the Torah is being interpreted from the people like we want that we we don't we don't think this is fair 
could you could you could you just reevaluate that <laughs> and uh, then we had Moses replacement and how he, and now Joshua and there's a lot to say about who Joshua is that in the beginning he's the he's the fighter he fights off Amalek um, in the when they first come out of Israel uh, out of Egypt and he transitions into being this loyal servant of Moses, learning from Moses, understanding Moses, trying to always be present to do whatever's needed, to do it with his full heart, to do it with his full intention of giving to the Jewish people, that he is somebody who can think about every single person like a shepherd who's taking care of every single sheep. We want people like that. Every single person matters, not just the people in the middle, not just the successful people or the pretty people or that. No, everybody has a piece, a soul, a something that is godly. And we should see that godliness in every person. So every person is equally valuable in our eyes because every single person is a soul. Um, he lays on, Moses lays on his hands onto Joshua to confer his hood, to confer his majesty, his, his knowledge, his, his light. So M M Joshua becomes the, s the moon to Moses' son, S-U-N. -S and, um, and then we have the daily offering and the everyday, consistent, persistent um, continuation of our um, service. That, we, that we, there's something about consistency and about perseverance that will pay off. And hopefully we find the right things to be persistent and consistent with that's that's what we need to do so um that's i think that's that's my synopsis for the day i hope that's useful i hope it's helpful please give me comments i'm always looking for feedback and uh, i wish everybody a really good week